Strength and honor. Strength and honor. Theodore Roosevelt once said, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena. I believe there's a hero in all of us that keeps us honest, gives us strength, makes us noble. So that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Seize the day. Whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. Who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause. And I'm gonna stay right here and fight for this lost cause. You've got to get mad. I mean plum mad dog mean. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Who at best, if he wins, knows the thrills of high achievement, and if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. I'm going to show you how great I am. Hi once again, everybody, and welcome into Studio A. I'm Ed Berliner, and this is the man in the arena. The arena today focuses on America, a very specific part of America. We need to laugh, America. We are a country right now that is so desperate to laugh, we are looking for it every single day, whether it's in our personal lives, our professional lives, social media especially. I don't know how many of you are on social media every day, but nobody laughs. Nobody really tries to laugh. It's all a big argument. And one of the single biggest issues regarding laughter, especially on the Internet, is satire. Used to be that satire was such a great form of comedy. It is an art form indeed. And as a matter of fact, it's tough to know these days what is satire and what is not. So here's what we're going to do, Nike. I'm boycotting you just like I did Google, just like I did Harley Davidson, just like I do the NFL except for Sundays and Mondays. I'm boycotting you. I'm done. I went down to one of your little stores Bought me $200 worth of stuff to show you how done I am, you know. I got uh, right here, New Jordans. I got the New Jordans. I'm not wearing these no more. I'm done. See, I'm not even done wearing your shoes. I'm done wearing your clothes, too. You see that? You see that, Nike? I'm done. Look at this. I'm done. You're not getting no more, no more of my uh, unemployment check. That's, that's for real. Look. Yeah, this is a sticker on the back of my truck, too. There's Nike. Here's me. Pissing all over it. You like that, Nike? Do you like it? Here's what we're going to do. You did this, Nike. You did this. Look at this. Look at this, Nike. You like that? There goes your stock prices, Nike. All because you want to mess around with a criminal. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to raise an emotional support beer to Nike and Colin Kaepernick because they're going to need it. That's your stock price right there, buddy. That's all you're going to get. So as always, crack the NFL and go Coats. <coughs> oh, God damn. I think I inhaled some of that smoke. Hands up from every single person in the audience that every single time something like that happens, you go, who are these clowns? Those are $250 sneakers. What are you burning them for? Give them away to somebody. Give them to charity. Do something with them. But people are doing it every single day. Ladies and gentlemen, that is satire. Of course, let's keep in mind that sometimes people don't really fall for satire. They think it's serious. And that starts a lot of arguments. Why? Laugh. It's satire. It's fun. It's funny. And we're going to spend some time laughing here, as a matter of fact, at satire and at a whole lot more. Our guest here on The Man in the Arena, he is a nationally touring stand-up comic. He's a writer. He's a podcaster. He's a part-time writer, I should point out, for The Bob and Tom Show, a nationally syndicated radio show that truly, in my mind, is one of the best morning radio shows, one of the best radio shows, period, when it comes to comedy. His YouTube videos rake in millions of views. We'll talk about that in a little bit, too, and where to find them. And his comedy album, Mr. Turkey, was number one on iTunes. We're looking to make this show number one on iTunes with our audio side of the podcast. So I figured, let's bring the big guy in today, if you will. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Brent Terhoon, the man in the arena, joins us today. Brent, how are you, my friend? Hey, good. Thanks for having me. What you do there is just brilliant satire, which we really need need so much of, it seems, these days. But that's a character that you do, and you yeah. get a lot of hits on that 
on YouTube, you've done a number of videos like that, but that's not your main character, which or what you do on stage. Let me stick to the mm-hmm. character here. What started him? What was it that made you think for YouTube videos, other than just doing performance videos, this is where I want to go? Um, it just was, you know, something that I did once and people thought it was funny. And, you know, I, so I did another one and then I did another one. Uh, and now, you know, it's people will come to my stand up shows, which is not that at all, and will quote the lines to me from the audience. Uh, it was just, it's a fun test because a lot of the videos are reactionary. Something happens in the news and I, I got a, I have a day or two before there's a new topic in the news cycle, uh, to come up with something funny. So that's a fun writing challenge, you know, spend an hour to see if I can come up with two minutes of material to say, you know. So, I mean, that's pretty much... Is that almost a little cathartic, though, because you just mentioned it. As a comic, the kind of comic that you are, a stand-up comic, when you travel the country, you're trying to find current material, and you have to stay up on the current material. But with something like that, you can let it float a little bit. It doesn't have to be immediately current, and it'll last a little bit on YouTube. Things like that, these comedy bits will stick around. So maybe as a writer, that becomes something that is... A little more fun, a little more entertaining, something which doesn't have the kind of pressure that comes with the every night having to get out there on stage? That's also another fun test, to see if I can make make you understand what I'm talking about a year later. Because comedy does not age well. You know, uh, a lot of times you do the, if it's a topical joke, you do the joke and then you got to throw it away and start again. It's not like music. You want to hear your favorite song a hundred times. But how many, time, how many times do you want to hear a joke? Because the surprise is gone once you've heard it once. Now, you that's know? interesting you said that, where you said comedy doesn't age well. I have friends of mine who are comics who've been doing the same material for 40 years, and people come well, back and, and see it over and over again. So what what is it in, in your experience that leads you to believe that some comedy just doesn't age well? Well, there's, you know, like your friends and I have that stuff, too, where you make it evergreen, where if I'm talking about my dad, you know, that's that's – on you know that's my experience and a lot of times if i have that experience a lot of people will have it too or i'm talking about my family you know but then there's topical stuff you know um you know if i was still talking about bill clinton you know exactly when i stopped writing jokes you know uh, and it's, especially you know with this type of character it's got to be uh topical and part of it is you're hitting on the hot button issue uh you know because i can talk about uh, you know, building a wall, and it's it's still a topic that people talk about, but it's not the hot button issue right now. And that's you know that's all those other guys that are actually being serious, talking about whatever political thing they want. You know, they're hitting on the hot button issue, so you got to strike while it's hot. So in that in that aspect, you know, some of the stuff doesn't age well, and then some of it is you can tell the joke over and over again. How do people accept? the satire because with your character it is a very pro-trump character but at the Mm -hmm. same time makes fun of donald trump and in these really politically charged times that we're in right now it's so difficult to tell a political joke without somebody becoming insulted so how do how do both sides deal with it and the kind of reaction that you get both from the the pro-trump and the anti-trumps when it comes down to looking at this kind of material uh, I mean, there's the same reaction from both sides because there are people that get what I'm doing. And if, if you're on the left, you like what I, you probably think it's funny. But if you're on the right, then you hate it. But then there's also vice versa. Some I've had people, you know, like I'm a Trump supporter, but I still think this is funny. And it, I think it all depends on your sense of humor, because if you can't laugh at yourself, then what else can you laugh at? Um, and a lot of times, you know, it. If it bothers you, maybe you see yourself in that character, you know? That comes down then to satire, because that's what you're doing. Satire used to be such a wonderful form of comedy. Yet, as I pointed out at the top of the show, I don't know about you, but I think satire gets lost anymore, especially in social media, because Mm -hmm. you can't have uh, an arched eyebrow. You can't have a, a wry smile. You can't make a hand gesture. You can't do anything with it. All it is is characters that are typed out there, and i got to believe that that's tough because in itself, satire, I hate to say this, Brent, but it seems like sometimes satire is becoming a dying form of comedy. 
Uh, it, I think, you know, it, it kind of is because satire is supposed to, you're supposed to take an absurdity, but then take it to 10, you know? But now with, with our world and everybody's got a camera in their phone, they're already starting at 10 and they're, they're being serious. It's hard to satirize a cartoon, you know, uh, somebody who buys fast food for a championship winning team, like Trump did, you know, it's like, that's already something that's already a joke that comedians would make, but the pres you're, you're already a cartoon. So it's hard to satirize something that is already so outlandish. Even the guys from South park, I've talked about it where it's like whatever they'll come up with something crazy, but then literally next week the president is doing that thing, you know, and that's people in general. You know, you, you see people sitting in their big truck or they have a, a rant video and you can't, you can't believe that this person is saying it because it's so outlandish, but they're serious, you know, so it's already hard to take it higher than where they're already starting. So I know you started very young as a kid, but how long have you been doing comedy professionally and on the road? I, I think, like, I've been doing stand-up for 13 years, and then after college, I was like, either I could get a real job, which it would have been, <laughs> in, you know, radio, uh, and, you know, or I could try stand-up, and, you know, I hadn't had to get a real job yet. <laughs> yeah, that's what pretty much every comic says at one time or another. Do I get a real job, or do I stick with this? 13 years then doing this, how have you seen audiences live audiences change um i mean there's always a phone aspect there's always people on their phone which that doesn't really bother me because you know if you're on your phone then that means you're not talking to me on stage you know you're, <laughs> it's kind Wait, of like let, let me stop you right there and i say this to every comic i talk to isn't it true that you've got to tell people in the audience do not heckle the comic is these these guys and gals are professionals. It is the dumbest thing you could possibly do is to get into a spit fight with a comic because you will lose every time. Yeah. Well, one is uh, illuminated and amplified. You're, you're already losing just by being the guy in the dark, but also somebody that does that for a career. You know, you're not usually, you know, nine times out of ten, you're not going to be funnier than the comic. <laughs> <laughs> you would hope they're not funnier than the comic because well, if they're funnier than you, it's maybe time to reassess yeah. your, your career. <laughs> then you got a problem. Uh, yeah. Before we take a quick break, uh, what is funny? Because I get a different answer from every single comic as to what they perceive as comedy and what's funny. I mean, that's that's the beauty and and. Uh, downfall of comedy is what is funny because we all have different experiences. Um, so sometimes, you know, if you tell a dark joke and somebody has been through that and they find it cathartic to laugh at that situation, but then other people, uh, they'll have the same situation and just get depressed. You know, it, it's, uh, it's really interesting to see what people think is funny and I, you can't pinpoint it down, but I think with funny, there's always, uh, surprise or a twist if you can be yourself because nobody else can be you but you uh but also relatable you know if you have a you know stuff about your family most people you know have a family and have done one thing or another so if people can say i've done that and they don't feel alone you know and maybe they don't feel alone in the first place but if you if they can uh if you're if you're truthful you comedy is one thing where if it's truthful, then it's funny. But if, if you don't find it truthful, then I, most times you're not going to laugh at it. I once had a friend of mine who is still a professional comic, very famous. I won't use her name. And in a moment of self-reflection, which was fueled by several really, really heavy scotch and nothings, uh, mm -hmm. said to me that in, in her opinion, she said, I'm the best therapist anybody will ever get, and they, they're getting me cheaper than anybody else. They're getting me for 20 bucks, two drink minimum, and, and, and a cover charge, and I'm going to make them feel good. As a comic, do you feel like there's – she used the word responsibility, which I found kind of interesting. She says it's my job to take people out of their daily lives and to sort of be that, that, that psychologist. Do you feel that way? I mean, I don't think it's 
I don't think it's my job necessarily, but I think it helps to forget about, you know, stuff. And that's why being off your phone is important during a show, just to be in the moment and, and laugh. It's therapeutic. Um, and I mean, it's not just comedy, but that's what movies are, is to make me not think about the bad things in my life, uh, even for a little bit, you know? Uh, so I think it is definitely therapeutic, even it, for the audience and for me. You said in an interview that I read that you were a shy guy as you were a kid. Is that true? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still shy. Stand-up has definitely helped my confidence because it's something I think I'm good at, you know. But I was so shy, I, I couldn't talk to anybody. and You know, I wouldn't make eye contact, any of that. So it's weird that public speaking was the thing to make me not shy. <laughs> when we come back, we're going to talk about not being shy on the road because if you're a comic... You're on the road most of your life, and what that's like is always something interesting. Brett Terhune is our guest. This is The Man in the Arena. I'm Ed Berliner. Stick around, everybody. We're going to take a break. We're going to come right back after this public service announcement about your health. My grandpa, old Pop Pop, I miss you every day, Pop Pop, he had a couple windmills in his backyard, and since he smoked about three packs a day, he was always out there just puttering around and Till one day he up and caught cancer and died, and it's because of them windmills. I know it. You know, I, I don't even trust no windmills anymore. I seen a little kid walking around out here with one of them pinwheels. I slapped it out of his hand. I said, "Thank me later when you don't get cancer." I don't think you realize how much, you know, how dangerous all this green energy is. You know, my friend he took a Uber home from the strip club, and guy was driving a Prius, one of them, you know, foo foo cars, and he caught my friend caught herpes because of that Prius you know I, I seen it firsthand I was down at Aldi's they give me one of them cloth reusable bags I'll be damned if I don't catch a touch of ED for the next couple weeks because of that bag y'all don't understand this shit is dangerous I'm at Berliner our guest is Brent Terhune who has created a character that caught my attention and catches a lot of people by the way your character caught my attention on Facebook and it gets a tremendous amount of coverage on Facebook. What's the reaction that you get back from people on social media? Because you do have your own website where you have your videos up. But when people see your videos like that, they're not really sure. There, there's, there's not a lot of explanation there. And I can see right away that there are some people who would go, wait a minute. That guy's making fun there. That's a real guy. So I, I can see right away that, that, that you're, they're buying the bit. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it's all by design to make you think it's real. I mean, because I, well, it, I guess it comes from I'm a big uh, pro wrestling fan, and they have something in pro wrestling. It's it's carny speak. It, they'll say it's the word kayfabe, which means if somebody w walked in the building when you're working on uh, a match, it means now uh, we're going to stay in character so they think it's real. So that's where I wanted to come from was to not break character, to not break uh, kayfabe, and to to just play the character and see how real you can think it is. When you know, right now it's never been easier in our our day and age to do research, to click one page over on my Facebook fan page and see that I'm a comedian. I don't actually talk like that. I I don't have those political views, but uh, just to see. You know, if if you believe it, you know, that's fun. Let's talk about being on the road because I mentioned that. And as somebody who's been doing this 13 years, I'm guessing, guessing that you probably are on the road, what, 250, 300 nights a year? Uh, yeah, it just depends. You know, some weeks are full weeks and some weeks it's a night and you make as much in that one night as the full week. It depends. Um, but, uh, I mentioned in that video that, uh, the guy drives a foo-foo car, a Prius. That's, I mean, that's what I... Don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell yeah. me. You drive a Prius. <laughs> I did. Well, it's gas mileage, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you so much for joining us for this interview today. We're so sorry to have brought you a guy who drives a foo-foo car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but see, you're being uh, smart. You got to get to the gas mileage. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's where the business thing. If you know, you can do stand up full time, but whether you want to make money or not is the different thing. And it, you know, that's it's not the motivation, but it certainly helps. <laughs> What's it and, like going through the booking process? Let's face it, you've got to be out there, and you've got to be. And 
I would imagine you're you're calling the clubs. Do you do you have an agent? Is somebody out there? Because there's got to be a massive fight to constantly get in one of these clubs and get in. You want to be in the prime spot. You don't want to be the guy who's showing up at uh, at seven o'clock in the evening when the headliner shows up at eleven. Yep. Yeah, it's it's a process of you know um, auditioning. So you drive to you know whatever city. Uh, you're more likely to get a job, I think, when whatever field is if you if you just talk face to face with somebody, um, or you send a tape and hopefully somebody even replies back when they get a hundred emails a day, you know, or more even more than that is you get a recommendation from another comedian, you know, we've all probably gotten a job from somebody because our friend recommended us, and that's mostly where the work comes from. So it pays off to be a good coworker. You're constantly auditioning for your same job because, you know, oh, the, the manager got fired at that comedy club and now there's a new manager and he doesn't know you, you know? Uh, so it's, it's uh, yeah, constantly auditioning for your same job. I was lucky enough to know a lot of the people who performed in Los Angeles many years ago when the comics were very big there and how they dealt with each other. It's a very different world out there in, in middle America in the smaller clubs because in L.A. there was a there was a real camaraderie between a lot of the comics. Uh, there was a feeling that they shared. A lot of them lived together. They ate together. But in a lot of these little cities and towns when you're around, is the same camaraderie there, or do you feel yourself with, with an even greater amount of... You know, I, I don't want to say that you're trying to undercut somebody, but there is a competitive level, isn't there? Because you're like the minor league ball player that's got to come in you got to hit 20 home runs in a night when you've got other people who are hitting 19 home runs every night, right? Uh, yeah, it, I guess it's competitive. I've never been one to be competitive with other comedians, you know. I've been competitive with myself to see, you know, was I as funny as I could be that night? And some nights I have a bad show, and from the audience perspective, it's not a bad show. But I know that I flubbed a couple lines, and I wasn't in the moment like I should have been. Um, so that's more where, where it's competitive, but there are guys that, you know, uh, will try and uh, even with bookers, they'll try and like undercut another booker. And so they'll say, I can book this for less money. And then, <clears throat> then the savings get passed on to the comics, you know, <laughs> sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. I can tell you, I've been in the entertainment industry a long time. I know, I know exactly how that works. So. You're out there, you're pushing your craft every single night, and you've been doing this for 13 years. You're making some noise right now. Social media is, is paying attention. You're getting the hits. I'm talking to you. People are, are watching Brent Terhune. What's What's next? I mean, where do you go from here? Where do you want to go from here that to you is going to, to take your comedy and your career to the next level? Um, you know, keep I guess keep making noise, but also have, you know, uh, every once in a while I do other videos that's not that character and I hope hopefully I build a, a following doing that character but uh, I'm I've been funny in other ways so hopefully to, to keep making more uh, videos um, that that aren't that character because that's that's also it's also you know I don't think I have the character down down you know that well but now to do a new challenge uh, and that you talked about you know how do you stay? invigorated on the road it's coming up with something else now that's a new challenge um ideally i'd like to have an, a new album out here in the next year um and uh, i wanted to not necessarily step outside of comedy but i've been working on a, a a horror movie i'm writing a horror movie right now so that's that's a thing where it's like comedy has been my passion but it's also a career so i i also like horror movies and stuff like that so i i'm working on that uh, and ideally, it's about a comedian because everything <laughs> in that world is accessible to me, so the budget can be $3, you know. Sure, why not? I, I do want to point out something, though. It's funny that you mentioned a horror movie, and I want to tell you something. Uh, as we're doing the research for the interview today, finding videos and, and pictures and stuff, I want to tell you something. You absolutely scared the living crap out of me, seriously, with one picture. Because, Brent, never, never... <laughs> Never feed a dog Paps Blue Ribbon beer. What what yeah. po what possessed you to do this, man? That poor dog. <laughs> it was well. It was him. I mean, he didn't leave me alone until I got him uh, a thirty pack of PBR. 
No. You don't you don't know frustration until a dog just will not leave you alone so you get him as alcohol. <laughs> well And he's almost twenty one in dog year, so I have to sneak it. It's not even your dog. <laughs> no. <laughs> which is the which is the worst part you're you're helping this poor dog lead a, a, a terrible life with PBR dude please i'm going to send you some sam adams or something i'll i'll send you anything just just keep it away from the dog don't 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 please don't let them do that here comes here's my real pet ah see there we go and the cat's name is uh soup cat S- yeah. as in s o u p soup Oh, you, yeah, that's not his real name, but we call him Soup Cat because he'll jump up on the counter and dip his paw in your soup and uh, or cereal, whatever you're – but then he has no intention of eating it. He just wants to test the consistency of it or something. So You're a cat guy, aren't you? Well, I'm, I'm an animal guy. That's what Good. I'm finding out. We, we, uh, my family always had dogs, uh, but we're just never home enough. So, yeah, cats are uh, just the, uh, the right amount of neglect that I need. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I hear that from people, too. They go, I can neglect the cat, and the cat is just fine. Now, let's go ahead and make sure that we get everything out there, because let's tell people that you are on Facebook, mm-hmm. correct? Uh, what's the handle on Facebook? What's the um, – you're under there? I think Yeah, I think it's facebook.com slash Brent Terhune. Slash Brent Terhune. Okay, how about Twitter? Uh, I think everything is – Twitter.com slash Brent Terhune and Instagram.com slash Brent Terhune. Uh, but my website has all the links to all that stuff, and that's BrentComedy.com. Hey, Brent, I got to tell you, your your stuff is brilliant. It just made me laugh out loud. And I love talking to comics because it's such a it's, it's a tough life, but it's a fun life. And I got a lot of friends that do this for a living. They're very poor. and <laughs> You don't do it for the money. Yeah. <laughs> God, God bless, because that's uh, you, you make us laugh, and that's really what we need in this day and age. I want to thank you very much. Good luck. Let's stay in touch, and let's make sure that when you come out with the new albums and things happen for you, let's make sure we have you back on the show. Will you please? That sounds great. Thank you. Outstanding. Brent Terhune has been our guest here on The Man in the Arena. Make sure you check out his stuff. A very funny guy, and these comics are working constantly. Reminder once again that if you want to just catch the podcast audio of our show, we are on all the basic platforms, iTunes, Spreaker, Radio Public, Google Play Music, TuneIn Radio. We're all there. Don't forget you catch these shows, the video shows, on YouTube. And if you want to send us an email, you can do so. It's arena at edberliner.com. Thanks for joining us. And until next time, rock on, true believers.